In terms of US versus China, uh, did they have a centrally pushed policy to invest and get ahead in AI? Yes, they did. It's a public strategy that they had. Were they organized for that competition? Yes, they were, just because they have a different political system. They can drive their private sector in this competition because there's a signal fusion that they right. have. Did they put enormous resources behind this? They, they did. Did they appoint national AI champions to serve as the companies that will propagate and advance or like the CCP agenda globally? Yes, they did. We all know that. I mean, and so I think in, in some aspects, the pre-gen AI period, uh, they were moving fast. We have to get ourselves organized. We have to finance ourselves, put enough resources. I think CHIPS Act is one of the elements, I think, towards that end. Hi, my name is Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. In this episode, I sit down with Ili Baraktari, Executive Director of the Special Competitive Studies Project, which is a follow-on organization to the National Security Commission on AI, focused on maintaining the U.S. lead in AI. Ili provides invaluable insights into the current state of the AI race between the U.S. and China, discussing the implications of the latest advancements in generative AI. He also sheds light on the so-called Offset X strategy, the National Plan for Microelectronics, and the upcoming Special Competitive Studies Project AI Expo in Washington, D.C. in May. Join us for an in-depth look at the critical role AI plays in shaping our national security. I hope you find the conversation as important as I did. Hi. Good tech solves problems that you've thought about. Great tech solves problems that you haven't even thought of. What can the commerce platform trusted by millions of merchants do for you? It's time for Shopify, the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling satin sheets from Shopify's in-person point of sale system or offering organic olive oil on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you're covered. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. And Shopify's truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklyn and and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ionai. That's shopify, S-H-O-P-I-F-Y dot com slash ionai. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. So sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash ionai. That's shopify, S-H-O-P-I-F-Y dot com slash ionai. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all lowercase all run together. They support us. So let's support them. I'm here at the Special Competitive Studies Project with Ili Barktari. It's a follow-on organization from the National Security Commission on AI, which Ili was also the executive director of. Uh, Ili, when, maybe we can start just by explaining uh, the, the the project, how it originated. I, I know the story of the Rockefeller project with his Kissinger, but if you could give that, and then we'll start talking about Absolutely. what you guys do. Uh, and thanks, thanks for uh, hosting us on your podcast. I mean, as as I've told you many, many times, we are big fans of your podcast. I mean, you're one of the first supporters of our work with NSCI, and we had an amazing series with you, so truly appreciate it. And it's a unique podcast, just so you know, as I told you before, because it's more specialized about uh, AI, and you have incredible guests, so it's an honor to be on your on your show. Um, the origins of uh, the Special Competitive Studies Project, or the SESP, really go back to towards the end of the, the commission's work. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, uh, Eric was writing a book with Dr. Kissinger, 
mm-hmm. on the age of AI. And Dr. Kissinger spoke fondly about a project he led in the 50s called Special Studies Project. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know much about the Special Studies Project. It's, you know, 1950s, not much you can find online. But as you noted, Rockefeller Brothers Fund back in the 50s thought that we are at the turning point in the history in which, you know, we're facing a competitor in Soviet Union. Uh, obviously, the word comp- competition and competitor was not used back in the 50s, right. more like adversary. Um, and so they thought that we still have not created a framework or a vision for how we should address that competition. I mean, and this was a battle of systems when you when you look at in the 50s. It was a, a communist system versus a democratic system. And I think the outcome was still unpredictable who's going to win at that point. So I think Rockefeller Brothers Fund funded a project uh, that uh, Dr. Kissinger led called Special Studies Project. And over the course of three years, they brought so like some of the most thoughtful leaders we had in the 50s from private sector academia and government to think about how do we get ourselves organized first Mm -hmm. how do we get our society organized how do we build our military uh, to face such a competitor and then how do we bring our allies and partners around the world to believe in the system values that we were projecting versus what the soviet union was projecting and so um dr kissinger uh, dr late dr kissinger now uh, in in the summer of 2021 uh, talk to Eric about relaunching that initiative. Um, I had an initial conversation with Eric about this. And when you think about it in 2021, um, same with the establishing of NSCI, we were, and, you know, we were really at the crossroad of the beginning of this AI revolution, mm-hmm. but also a changing geopolitical world order. And so I thought we were positioned uh, in, in, a, in a really unique place uh, to create special competitive studies project. Um, I added com- competitive in the title uh, because uh, I called my my old uh, uh, my old boss and mentor, Bob Work, and I said, hey, uh, I'm thinking about launching this project. Eric is really interested. Um, would you join? Uh, first of all, uh, what do you think about the project? And he said, you got to add com- competition in the title because we're in competition with China and in, com- in competition with China, you either win or lose. And you're, you're familiar with Bob Work. You hosted him numerous times on your show. He's he's a really thoughtful leader when it comes yeah. to grand strategy, China competition, and AI. And so obviously I listened to him and we added a C in the, in our title to make, it, to make it a little bit different from the project in the 50s. Um, and so with that in mind, we created SESP. Uh, initially, uh, the conversations with Eric were that we were focused on a three-year project mm-hmm. just because in my mind and I think in Eric's mind is um, if we are here in March of 25, 26, and we're still talking about the same topics that you and I have talked many times on your podcast, I think we might be uh, risking of uh, falling behind China. Um, now you see also a convergence of uh, uh, what we call it the axis of disruptors, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea uh, against the democratic bloc. And I think uh, the the challenge in 25, 20, 30 timeframe, it's much, much higher of a conflict uh, that could could become between you know these two systems of of thoughts of political systems and beliefs and so I think SCSP could play a vital role there in terms of like how do we get ourselves organized how do we you know increase awareness of what's going on uh, and play uh, a role like they did in the fifties in which you know when they published their book uh, which sold four hundred thousand copies and it's really difficult to find today called Prospect for America um, you know. They educated the, and informed American citizens, obviously, of uh, what we were facing against uh, in terms of Soviet Union challenge. And I think that then our get ourselves organized from the 50s to the end of the Cold War, where we you know, ultimately you know, won. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of like the origins of SESP, uh, Greg, but happy to have it. Answer yeah. any questions. Yeah, and, and you've come out with a series of, of reports and mm-hmm. and. Uh, m- my understanding is your audience is really the legislative branch and the executive branch, mm-hmm. right? You're trying to influence yeah. policy, and and I know the shortly after the the end of the National Security Commission, uh, there was the Chips Act, which I, I don't know the inner workings, mm-hmm. but it sounded like it came mm-hmm. uh, right out of the right. NSCAI's mm-hmm. final report. So, can you talk about That's how? Right. Yeah. that pipeline uh, yeah. gets implemented. Yeah, so first of all, uh, let me talk about the NSCI. Uh, w- when you go back in 2018, when I think the legislation got passed for the creation of NSCI, 
I think, you know, in 2018, the, the issue of AI and the geopolitical competition was not on everyone's mind, probably. Right. Um, and so I think what I give Congress credit to is um, they were getting signals, A, from private sector, that there's a powerful technology coming that you have covered for such a long time, and that B, China, our competitor, our main competitor, uh, really is putting all the resources, all sort of like the energy behind this technology because at that at that time they came up with the strategy that they wanted to be the global AI power by 2030. And so I think with these two factors in mind, Congress created the commission. Um, I also think it's the first time that in absence of our federal government having a clear strategy mm -hmm. on a te specific technology, Congress stepped in to fill that void. And I think they, they do this with commission, as you know, occasionally. Um, and so I think we stepped into a space in which was, number one, um, highly bipartisan. Uh, you know, the CHIPS Act, but like when you when you put technology competition in China, uh, there's a huge bipartisan support in Congress. Right. Uh, because I think there's a wide recognition that failure to uh, stay behind in this technology could have consequential uh, impact for our society and our economy and ultimately national security. And so I think the, the NSCI really moved into that space. Mm -hmm. uh, we were lucky and fortunate that Congress appointed 15 individuals with a huge, uh, you know, difference in their background mm -hmm. that I think benefited us as, as a staff at that point. But also, um, you know, when we were going around departments and agencies and looking at what they were doing with AI and what do they need to do more, um, I think these individuals really step forward to serve the country. I don't think that gets much credited in today's environment, to be honest with you, but having some of the top technology leaders, yeah. some of the top academic leaders, and some of the top former government officials looking at what can we do more for our country in this competition, I think that would deserve a much bigger praise. In terms of the audience, our, our, our job with NSCI was pretty straightforward. We had to provide Congress with recommendations on how do we maintain global AI leadership for national security purposes. And I like to underscore the national security piece here because the commission was not what can we do with AI in terms of our education and our society and our healthcare. Uh, you know, the commission was tasked by the Armed Services Committee on the Hill. So the number one customer were the armed services agencies and the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. And so we had a really narrow focus. What we tried to do with the SCSP from the beginning, Craig, is that um, we take a more of a whole of nation approach. Mm -hmm. And so we have a team that is focused on the economic impact of AI. We have a team that is focused on, you know, what are the next generation of technologies that we have to stay ahead. We cover the impact on education, impact on workforce. Some of the p topics that were uh, not included during the NSEI right. were in terms of audience. Um, you're right. Um, obviously, Congress uh, is a is a major piece of who we try to like inform. Um, we also work with all the departments and agencies in in Washington, and more broadly with you know governors and state levels and anybody else. Because I said we try to take a different approach with SCSP, like more of a whole of nation. Mm -hmm. If you and I believe that AI is a transformative technology or once in a generation technology, then I think this is more than just a national security challenge or opportunity we have. We have to take a more of a holistic, whole of nation transformation uh, approach to this. And so with SCSP, we take more of that approach. So we spend a lot of time, you know, at the state, local level, we spend a much more time with allies and partners. And so we try to like, we try to analyze like, what are the, some of the implications and what are some of the huge opportunities AI will have for across, you know, domains from economy and society and national security. Right. Uh, well, let's talk about some of those specific uh, reports and recommendations. You you came out with this offset X strategy, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. uh, is, is sort of a reference to, to the third offset uh, strategy under Ash Carter, I think it was. Uh, and Bob Work. What's that? And Bob, and Bob, Bob yeah. Work. I'm sorry. Yeah, Bob was kind yeah. of the driver. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and that's, as you just said, you're really focused on the, on the competition with China. I'm, I'm curious, you guys look at China closely, uh, you track it. Uh, there has been a debate about how advanced China is. There was this Australian think tank 
that uh, that came out and said mm -hmm. China's mm -hmm. ahead in, mm -hmm. I don't remember, 33 of 47 mm -hmm. categories or something. I'm sure you know Jeffrey Ding at, yeah. at, the, at George Washington here in, in D.C. Uh, he His argument is that you can't look at those top line numbers. Uh, you have to look at, you know, which are, are patents and papers and and funding, you have to look at the diffusion, as he calls it, of AI into mm. the economy. And that if you look at through that lens, the US remains far ahead mm -hmm. of China. And he argues that the there's a certain amount of hype around the China threat uh, in order to get policy passed. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, mm -hmm. you guys look at this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so you raised a lot of questions there. You started with Offset X, which I can come back later if you yeah, want, Craig. Sure. But yeah. uh, in terms of U.S. versus China, uh, so we have looked into this for, for a while now. Um, and, the, the, and there's a pre-Gen AI period probably, right. and yeah. there's, I think, post-Gen AI period, yeah. which I think people sometimes, as you know, mix both what AI and Gen AI is. Um, the first interim report we published with NSCI, which was a requirement from Congress, we we came up explicitly saying that, you know, we are ahead um, by maybe two years, but they're catching up fast. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was our first judgment that we made right. with NSCI. And I think our thinking there was similar to what, what you mentioned, Jeff Ding and everybody else talking about, like, it's not just the level of uh, investment, it's the application, adoption, people, uh, hardware. There are numerous factors uh, you, can, you can compare here. And sometimes, as you know, this is not like a apples to apples analysis, mm -hmm. just because they have a different system and we have a different system. But when you look at it you know, on just some, some high level themes, you know, um, did they have a centrally pushed policy uh, to invest and get ahead in AI? Yes, they did. It's a public strategy that they had. Mm -hmm. Were they organized for that competition? Yes, they were just because they have a different political system. They can drive their private sector in this competition mm -hmm. because there's a similar fusion that they right. have. Um, did they put enormous resources behind this? They, they did. Did they appoint national AI champions to serve as the companies that will um, propagate and advance or like the CCP agenda globally? Yes, they did. We all know that. I mean, and so I think in, in some aspects, the pre-gen AI period, uh, they were moving fast. And I think that was the concern that uh, led Congress to create NSCI because the, all the signals coming out of Beijing yeah. were that they, are, they have taken this technology so seriously. Um, and I didn't mention data. I didn't mention the application against that we have seen against the minority population they have done, the use of surveillance cameras and all those yeah. things. So all these like small tactical elements, when you add them at the strategic level, was a source of concern for our country, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's one. The second thing I would argue is... Um, um, is that, as you know, this is a dual purpose technology. Mm -hmm. So I think like you cannot in isolation say, oh, let them get ahead in AI because we are leading in other elements of the technology competition. Mm -hmm. I believe because AI is more akin to a um, general purpose technology, you cannot have your main competitor who also is a completely different political system get ahead in that space. And so that's why I think the the concern was in 18, 19, and 20 is that with those elements in mind and those signals coming out of Beijing, we have to get ourselves organized. We have to finance ourselves, put enough resources. I think CHIPS Act is one of the elements, I think, towards that end. Uh, so that's one thing. Post-Gen AI, I think it's a little bit different conversation. Uh, first, because most of the, I think, best models came out of U.S. companies, mm -hmm. number one. So there's an advantage there that I think we have. Secondly, is that a lot of these models, as you know, need a lot of data to be trained. Uh, and Internet is 60% in English, and I think it's 2 to 5% in Mandarin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so the, the, the training of these models requires a lot of data in your native language. And I think that's what probably holds China back in some elements. Third is... We placed uh, a lot of um, controls on cutting edge chips, which I think makes Chinese companies really difficult to get 
uh, you know, to these models without having access to these cutting edge chips. And, and, and you're familiar with the export controls we placed on high end chips. And then the last element here is that, uh, you know, we live in a democracy. You can easily prompt these models to say something about you or me or political system or political leadership, and they'll do it so long, yeah. you know, you're not offending somebody or you're not seeking to, to use it for malign purposes. As you know, you can't do this in China. Yeah. And I think that will hold China back in probably in these models um, because uh, they'll probably have to place much more um, uh, or heavier control on the models and these models get better and better by using them, as you know. Right. So I think Gen AI gives you a different picture. Will this stop China? I don't think so. Because as you know, they understand that this is a critical technology. Are they gonna seek a different architecture to go after you know, different AI models and you know, like, a, like take a pass on Gen AI competition? Probably because I think there are multiple ways here to get to the next generation of AI models. Um, but I think right now, uh, with these models being released from primarily U.S. companies, you can m make, a, I think, a serious bet that we are definitely in head in two to three years yep. time, time space. Yeah. Uh, and you on the on the Gen AI, it's interesting, the idea that they'll they maybe will will take a pass on that. But already the technology or the research is moving beyond large language yeah. models into yeah. multimodal models exactly. and combinations of LLMs and video and audio. And, yeah. yeah. Language. Yeah. I mean, uh, large visual models. Yeah. I mean, DeepMind has some amazing work out and yeah. OpenAI just came out with Sora, which people look at as kind of a entertainment, but, but there is the kernel of AGI in there. Yeah. Um, so things are moving so fast. How do you guys keep up with that? Mm. How do you keep uh, Congress and the executive branch mm. and work with them to keep them at the at the leading edge? Because governments everywhere are notoriously slow. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, the release of ChatGPT really uh, gave us a new momentum. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know this. I mean, all of a sudden. You know, everybody started to talk about AI. Um, people are using these models now. Um, they're, uh, and we're facing probably a phase, which I think in the next three years, we're going to live in this co-piloting phase where, mm -hmm. you know, everything we do uh, is with these models. Um, so I think the conversation has changed dramatically, Greg, as you know, from like 2019 yeah. and 20, because now AI has become a mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, and so... To a certain degree, this is no longer a difficult uh, space to explain to people what it means, because I think if you look at just the in the last 12 months, what has happened in this space, you have uh, the White House releasing the White House executive order on AI, which is probably one of the longest EOs uh, you have ever seen. And I think that is a demonstration of how seriously uh, uh, the, the White House has taken this technology. Um, I can never recall. I cannot recall a technology that we have released such a deep and thorough uh, executive order uh, to all the departments and agencies. So that's one. You have a a massive effort uh, on the congressional side, led by four senators: uh, Senator Schumer, Senator Young, Senator Heinrich, and Senator Rounds, um, that have organized uh, hearings after hearings called the AI Insight Forum, um, in educating members of Congress and Senate about AI from all aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, civil rights leaders, you have technology leaders, you had national security leaders really coming in front of the senators, explaining the implications of Gen AI uh, mm -hmm. for our country. Um, on the on our allies and partners side, you have the EU AI Act mm -hmm. uh, that was passed a month ago or two months ago. So just in the last four months, you have this enormous activity on the policy side of trying to get ahead on a technology that is moving so fast, as yeah. you know. Um, and so we will always face that challenge. Like, how do you stay ahead on a technology that constantly changes, new models are released, and then you have the open source path, you have the, um, you have the proprietary models path. Uh, but I think uh, from the, so like awareness perspective, I think everybody's aware uh, this is moving uh, and th there are efforts to understand how do you stay ahead how do you get organized to stay ahead? Because I think 
if you look at our government institutions, they are built uh, after World War II mm-hmm. with the 1947 Act. So uh, I usually use the example of Department of Commerce. If you look at our, you know, key elements of our competition with China reside within Department of Commerce. But that Department of Commerce was built for the Cold War competition. Yeah. And now we're in this techno-economic competition with China. So do we have to uh, reform institutions? Do you need to create new ones? After 9-11, you know, we created a, a, a range of institutions. Uh, we use the example that even at the White House, you need a different constellation of um, councils uh, yeah. to go after the technology competition. Um, I think I used this example in the past, but after World War II, we created the National Security Council at the White House because security was the predominant domain of competition between us and Soviet Union. Uh, after the Cold War ended, we created the National Economic Council because the economy became, you know, as part of that globalizing uh, you know, discourse, the key component of the world order. Um, and then after 9-11, we created a domestic policy council uh, to focus on, uh, you know, issues related to terrorism, counterterrorism, you know, um, our presence in the Middle East and whatnot. So are we now in a new era? I believe so. Are we organized for this era? Not yet. Uh, all the departments and agencies in New York, Craig, are moving. Um, but um, usually our government moves when something bad happens and requires us to wake up, I think 9-11 was that wake-up call, and we created DNI, and we created all these other agencies uh, and, and offices. Uh, I think AI has that momentum for us to relook uh, or we organize for the AI era. And I think we were at the beginning, as you know, of the AI era, because it will have huge implications sure. for the education yeah. and workforce and government and everything else. So I think that is when I think we step in as SESP because we have the luxury to think outside. We're also surrounded by technologies, academics, private sector leaders who think a lot in this space. And so then what we do is we take all these conversations and we put it in, in a format to help our government move forward uh, on all these conversations. Yeah, um, there's so much to talk about. Can you give us a, a quick overview of the Offset X strategy? Absolutely. And then I want to talk about yeah. the action plan for microelectronics. No problem. Uh, so Offset X, um, part of our, one of our lines of efforts here is focused on, you know, the implications of AI and all these emerging tech for the military uh, and uh, the future of warfare. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so uh, you mentioned third offset. Uh, I was really fortunate to work for Bob Work and you know, like a a lot of things that Bob Work was trying to push through uh, inside the Department of Defense really was um, early identification that the the warfare is changing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm talking about 2014, 15 and 16 when I think he started talking about the implications of technology and AI the future of warfare, China really uh, trying to get ahead, um, us losing sort of like the uh, the military supremacy and whatnot. And so what we try to do with Offset X is really looking at, you know, what are some of the key technologies that are happening right now uh, that could give us a an edge on the mm-hmm. battle space? Um, we also looked at uh, what's happening in Ukraine now. Mm-hmm. So with those two elements in mind, we thought, the future of warfare really will be characterized by three primary factors. Number one is we will move into the space, and you can see this in Ukraine and elsewhere, of many network distributed uh, platforms. These are small, you can think of drones, you can think of uncrewed systems, but you know, uh, the future of battlefield as you see it in Ukraine is that of you know, drones, um, um, first person view drones, uh, many highly networked communicating with each other, communicating with humans in, in sort of like de- deployment and execution of the mission. And so that is one of the elements of the Offset X. The second element is um, software supremacy. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you look at what we have as a country, a uh, comparative advantage over probably our main competitors is that, you know, we have some of the top leading software companies. And software is changing everywhere. It has changed how we work how you know, we receive information and it's changing the the warfare. Mm-hmm. And so how do we, and you know, our department is really notorious in terms of buying software and updating it regularly. So how do we stay and how do we make the Department of Defense a software oriented 
uh, Department for the Future Warfare. If you look at what's happening again in Ukraine, in the Middle East, and elsewhere, is that, you know, if you have cutting edge software, it will give you, you know, information advantage. It will give you situational advantage. It, it will allow you to defend against information operations that the enemy is pushing towards you, but also you can you can launch information operation against your adversary. So staying ahead in the software space was the second element we thought the offset X should, should be focused on. And the third element was really the human machine teaming. Human machine teaming, because if you look at all these systems, uh, there's a degree of human control and there's a degree that then these systems will um, complement human advantages. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we move into the future of battle space, we will have human machine teaming in how we do intelligence analysis, in, in terms of how we do uh, military operations, and in terms of how we, you know, we get situational awareness and whatnot. So I think training humans in using better these capabilities will allow us to have a edge over our adversary. Um, I think our military is always ahead when it comes to the traditional training, but I think the situation is changing that um, if the drones have proven to be so successful in the battle space of Ukraine, you know, I believe that we should have a drone unit in every yeah. other services uh, that people are trained on how to use these drones. Um, because in Bob Ward has the saying that every military technology revolution that has happened, especially in the military space, has allowed us to um, focus on precise attacks and the execution of the mission. That uh, on, in itself has uh, limited and uh, so like diminished uh, the collateral damage yeah. because the attacks have been more precise, more targeted. And I think, you know, this new wave of technologies will allow us to enter faster into that space by having AI enabled systems uh, that are like human uh, that have meaningful human control and they're deployed for, you know, um, all aspects of the military operations. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of things in, in the offset X strategy that, that struck me. Uh, one, you, you talk about, uh, and with regard to drones, counter autonomy capabilities, mm -hmm. the U.S. has been uh, pretty clear uh, uh, to date that, that they uh, don't endorse lethal autonomous weapon systems uh, but it's 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 a little bit like a refining uh, uranium uh, it's it's the same technology you just go a little bit further and it's autonomous um, what does that mean anti-autonomy uh, counter autonomy yeah counter autonomy yeah. i'm sorry so there, there, there are two things and i think um we've talked about lethal autonomous weapon systems um uh, on, like chapter four of the NSCI really covered the lethal autonomous yeah. systems. And I think we came up with some conclusions. Number one was that the department is really well positioned to build and deploy these systems. And I think we came to that conclusion because, you know, the commissioners that came from, as I said, private sector academia and former government were exposed to briefings and, um, you know, um, policies and procedures that the department has in place uh, before it builds uh, tests and evaluates and deploys these capabilities. Because I think you have to separate fact from fiction sometimes yep. in this conversation. Uh, I think uh, uh, we were heavily influenced by number of movies in this space, mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is a little bit different. You know, yeah. a department, uh, when you look at the first memo the department under Secretary Austin issued when it came to AI, it was on the responsible and ethical use of artificial intelligence. And I think uh, the leadership of the Pentagon wanted to demonstrate that they take this technology seriously like every other technology mm -hmm. they have used in the past. There are certain procedures and certain rules in which they have before they test, they take, they test, evaluate, and then they deploy these capabilities. So that's one. On the second, uh, the second aspect of this is that there's a political declaration the State Department um, has, um, has, uh, has uh, issued, and I think you have a dozens of countries that have... Uh, signed into that political declaration that no matter how the future warfare changes because of these systems, I think we should make sure that these systems are built and deployed in responsible and ethical way. Obviously, I don't think up to now China or Russia have signed that political declaration. I don't expect that because, as you know, we have never seen anything coming out of Russia 
or China in terms of how they plan, how they build, and how they're going to use these systems. And they've used them. I mean, we all know Russia has used autonomous systems in Syria. Yep. They failed, but still, yep. nevertheless, uh, it's not that uh, I think they they follow some kind of policy procedures like we would uh, in those circumstances. Um, the second aspect of your question was about... Um, well, w w when you say develop counter-autonomy... Yeah, uh, the counter-autonomy. So the counter-autonomy is a... Is a, is a is a different space here because you we're entering a phase in which you have a lot of these systems being deployed autonomously, mm -hmm. and and obviously um, every autonomous system will have a counter autonomous system that seeks to you know uh, block it, uh, shut it down, and whatnot. And so, are we positioned even for that space? where a lot of these systems will be systems against systems uh, over the air, in the battle space. And so how do you make these systems resilient, um, cyber-proof, that your adversary cannot take it over and turn it against you? So I think that is another area that will probably evolve uh, you know, in an accelerated way in the next three to five years. Because as you can see from the Ukraine battle space, a lot of these systems are becoming autonomous, um, I mean, one of the articles we, we published was that the Ukraine airspace is dominated by autonomous systems, small drones or medium-sized right. drones of both sides. And so in that environment, you know, how do you build these systems that um, you can ensure that they are proof of cyber attack, that your adversary cannot hack them and turn them against you? So that is the counter-autonomy piece that I think right. uh, will will enter into the, the battle, space, uh, battle space policy uh, in the next couple of years. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I thought more that counter-autonomy were systems because if the U.S. is not using autonomous weapons uh, and the adversary is, you at least need a way to counter their autonomous yeah. weapons because mm -hmm. it becomes asymmetrical yeah. very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing in in, in the uh, Offset X, uh, you, you talk about disrupting disrupting adversaries' communications uh, and I assume b because uh, the the offset X is really looking at at China, you now have Russia reportedly uh, planning to to uh, field uh, anti satellite weapons mm -hmm. in uh, outer space, mm -hmm. which is would devastate our ability to to communicate. Yeah. So, yeah, can you talk about? No, I mean, uh, absolutely. Like, look, if you look at the importance of space um, that that has grown over the last couple of years, both in terms of um, where our adversary has invested, uh, deployed and tested capabilities, but also uh, if you look at the private sector on our side and how much, you know, um, the space has proliferated both in terms of launches, in terms of satellite constellations, um, and then, you know, reliance on Starlink, for example, in Ukraine, uh, that tells you a lot of how space is a key component now of the battle space mm -hmm. and, and the warfare. Um, I think some of the analysis uh, that we have probably published is, um, you know, I think the first, the first move by the Russian military uh, against uh, the Ukrainian military was to try to shut down their, I think, satellites. Uh, and so this goes back to like, you know, because space gives you uh, information awareness, communication, uh, command and control. And so space is a critical component of, you know, how we're organized now for the future of uh, the warfare. You talk about on the, the national plan for, for microelectronics, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about addressing uh, the threat of China's massive massive build out of legacy chips, yeah. uh, and, and there's some other really interesting things in there. This innovator visa category, which yeah. I, I'm all for. Yeah, yeah. On the on the Chinese chips, so mm -hmm. there's been a big debate about yeah. whether the export controls haven't created yeah, 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 a yeah, bigger yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah. First of all, I think the export control really aimed to what I think the national security advisor said. You know high fence, small garden approach. Mm -hmm. um, the export controls were designed, I think, in a way and targeted uh, to prevent China from having access to the cutting edge semiconductors. Yeah. Not all semiconductors, but the cutting edge semiconductors. So that's one thing, because I think, as you know, these are the semiconductors that um, allow you to get to these high-end uh, AI models. Um, so that's one. Um, 
I don't think that has prevented China from investing on all other aspects of semiconductor uh, industry. Hmm. Um, nor, I think, uh, it has prevented China from trying to circumvent export controls by getting access to, uh, you know, clouds in third countries uh, or uh, buying a new design of a similar chip from, from certain companies. So I think uh, um, the, the issue of export controls, I think it did have an effect. Um, I mentioned earlier, look at uh, the general AI models. Uh, yeah. where, where are our companies versus the Chinese companies? So that's one. Secondly is the ex export controls have been in place since October 2022. Mm -hmm. So usually, you know, you, the, you know you, these effects will not be immediate. You have to think about it in terms of three to five years yeah. and how much uh, I think that has an effect on uh, the Chinese access to these to these capabilities. Uh, and I think as, uh, as I think the White House has said many, many times, these were not uh, intended, um, you know, to slow China down is forever. They were intended to give us a competing edge, right. uh, a window that we stay the leading technology. Yeah. Um, and while we did the, the protect side of the export controls, we also did the promote. We have invested through the CHIPS Act $52 billion right. on a domestic fabs. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, companies have also came on top, com they came on top of that to announce their investments here. Yeah. Uh, and so I think not only you have to slow them down, you, you con continuously have to evolve in this space. Secretary Raimondo said yesterday that maybe we might need another CHIPS Act. Yeah. Um, and I think the demand, as you can see from what's happening right now with the chips worldwide, is so big uh, that I could probably foresee another chip sack uh, in yeah. the next, because I think the first chip tag was like just trying to catch up. Yeah. And I think staying ahead in the space uh, will probably require more investment. Yeah, I, I guess what, what I'm referring to is it's also spurred China uh, to, to have a national plan to become independent in high-end semiconductors, yeah. you know, everything from lithography yeah. uh, on. And that's not necessarily a good thing if if they're no longer dependent on Western supplies. No, I and I understand that argument, uh, Craig. I would argue that China would have done that uh, anyway. Uh, because I think if you look at the China uh, policy made in China 2025, which is also uh, known as the dual... Uh, uh, dual circulation policy is they have a strategy in place, uh, and this is a public document, that they want to be independent uh, from the world supply chain, but they want the rest of the world to be dependent on their supply chain. Yeah. And so I think they would pursue the, the, the semiconductor path of independence regardless of our export controls, just because they look at what's happening in Ukraine uh, with us sanctioning Russia and their access to semiconductors. And I think the technology aspect of their like national security approach is it shouldn't serve as a weak point in whatever they decide to do around Taiwan, wherever the uh, global ambitions are in South Southeast Asia. And so I don't think they would have let the technology piece be their weak point in pursuing their like regional and global goals. Yeah. So I think Bottom line, as I said, I think they would have pursued the path towards semiconductor uh, design, fabrication, and production independent of our export controls. I think we have managed to slow them down, um, and I think this will have implications for the next couple of years. Can you talk a little bit about the National Semiconductor Technology Center, mm -hmm. uh, that proposal? Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the National Center is, uh, was part of our recommendation with NSCI. Because what we argued in uh, an SEI report is not only need resources to catch up and build some of these manufacturing capabilities uh, back to the United States, you need a center that brings together probably our government labs, university labs, to look at what's the next generation of semiconductors we have to look after. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, we're getting close to the end of the nanometer or the Moore's law. And so there are different paths now that you can take in terms of uh, how is the future of semiconductor going to look like. And I think we need a center like that. We need a center that the only job and the only objective is to look at what is the post-mortem law world look like in terms of semiconductors. 
uh, I think with the right actors, with the right leadership, and I think Secretary Raimondo has, 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 has been a force of nature in this space, uh, that center should focus on really coming up with a couple of options that we should have as a country, as a government, in pursuing uh, you know, in the next three, ten years uh, of, of, this, uh, of this technology. Okay. Can you talk about this expo yeah. that's coming yeah, yeah. up in May? Uh, so the expo is uh, probably a unique gathering in D.C., uh, it's a classic AI Expo in in, in in a sense that nobody has ever organized this in Washington. You have AI Expos around the world. You have the CES in Vegas. But in Washington, nobody has ever brought together the technology companies, small, medium sized and large companies with government agencies, with academic labs in one place where they can showcase technology. So this is not just a conversation. This is not just releasing another policy document. This is really bringing together in one place people to see demos of these technologies, to have conversation around these technologies, to exchange business cards, because our government desperately needs to modernize when it comes to these technologies. There's an enormous capacity in private sector to offer these technologies to government. So this will be a unique place over the course of two days at our convention center May 7th and 8th, for all these stakeholders to come together, talk, engage, and really deepen their relationship when it comes to AI and emerging tech. Yeah. How much of that will be focused on national security? A fraction, uh, Greg, because what, what we have said is, uh, you know, there are probably 19 departments and agencies in Washington, D.C. Um, and so I think what we want to focus on is there's a certain elements of the conversation and companies that are tailored for Department of Defense and the intelligence community. But I believe we can provide a useful service here for health and human services, FEMA, because as you know, these models can do in incredible yeah. prediction of hurricanes, weather forecasting. So by bringing not just DOD and IC related companies, but other uh, companies that have services and have technologies in this space, I think we would really um, do a huge service to other non-DOD and non-IC related departments and agencies in DC uh, with the AI Expo. Okay, great. Well, I'll be there, and uh, I appreciate the time. I know you you've got a tight schedule, so thanks for having me, Craig. It's always a pleasure, uh, yeah. and I see you on May seventh. Hi, good tech solves problems that you've thought about. Great tech solves problems that you haven't even thought of. What can the commerce platform trusted by millions of merchants do for you? It's time for Shopify, the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling satin sheets from Shopify's in-person point of sale system or offering organic olive oil on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you're covered. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. And Shopify's truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklyn and and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ionai. That's shopify, S-H-O-P-I-F-Y dot com slash ionai. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. So sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash ionai. That's shopify, S-H-O-P-I-F-Y dot com slash ionai. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all lowercase all run together. They support us, so let's support them. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Ely for his time. If you're in the Washington, D.C. area in May, be sure to check out the Special Competitive Studies Projects AI Expo. I'll be there, and if you see me, say hello. In the meantime, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world, so pay attention.